It's a, a joy to be with you again. If you can just turn your Bibles with me, if you have them, to John chapter 6, of, uh, John 16. I just want to take the next few moments and talk about the subject of experiencing God's joy in the midst of crisis and looking at uh, the exhortation of the Lord uh, for us to be a people who are of good cheer. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you are in us and that we are in you, and that your son, uh, through his shed blood, Father, gave us access to your glorious presence. And Father, we ask you that you would increase the manifestation of your presence on our hearts and uh, on our minds. Lord, that you would open up our eyes to your law to behold uh, glorious and marvelous things. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, before we look uh, uh, specifically at John 16, verse 33, I just want to just give uh, a little bit of a broader context of what it is that is taking place here. Uh, it so happens to be that John 13 and John 17 are, to me, uh, my, my favorite portion of Scripture. I just absolutely love just what the Lord has to say uh, uh, to us about love uh, about peace and joy and confidence in our future, uh, just the free access that we have uh, to the Lord's presence, um, our interaction with the Father, His interaction with us. I mean, it's absolutely amazing what those uh, five chapters, those six, five to six chapters talk to us about. I want to encourage anyone to regularly uh, uh, visit those chapters. Now, uh, specifically in uh, John chapter 14, uh, Jesus starts his exhortation by telling his disciples to not be troubled, uh, to not be weighed down with fear and with anxiety because of the different things that are about to take place uh, at their particular time because the Lord is about to die on the cross and the apostles are about to... Um, just get lost in a pretty intense crisis, a personal crisis, because uh, their personal friend um, is going to go to a cruel death on the cross. They go through a spiritual crisis because of who he is with regards to the spiritual promises. And they're also going to go through a, a, a crisis, really a, a political crisis in some ways, because uh, the hope of the nation was, in their mind, was, uh, was upon, uh, upon this man, the Messiah, which it was, but what they did not factor in was the fact that he was, he was going to die on the cross. And so the fact that their Messiah, who was to deliver them from the Romans, was about to die a Roman death, was just going to cause all kinds of worldview and social and political clashes in their minds. And so Jesus tells them ahead of time, he says, look, he says, don't be troubled, believe in me. And then he ends his instruction in John 16, verse 33, with a very similar exhortation, a, a, a different, he uses different words, but in essence, he, he starts his teaching with, look, don't be troubled, and then really from, uh, six, uh, from uh, chapter 14, verse 1, all the way to 1633, he just gives line upon line of information and insight of how our hearts can be freed from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the yoke of anxiety uh, and fear. Now, um, in verse uh, 33, he starts, I'm just going to look at the different phrases in that verse. He starts out by saying, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In other words, he says, I'm, I, I, I'm telling you things ahead of time so that when these things take place, you're not confused as to what has taken place, that you, that you can go, okay, you know, I, I I expected this to take place. Now, how that relates to where we're at today is that we're living at a time where, when there is a, a tremendous spiritual, uh, political pressures that are mounting. Again, uh, uh, September 11th, if, if, if it indicated anything to us, is that um, as a nation, we are far more vulnerable than we realized uh, militarily and to acts of terror. Not only that, but the last... You know, six to eight years, there's been a very clear, rapid moral decline in society. There's been a, a, a rapid moral decline even within, uh, uh, within the community of the faith. And not only that, there's been a confusion about the grace of God. Uh, there's a distorted message about grace and, 
and overlooking the fact that grace truly was the free gift of God given to us to not only bring us into salvation, but to actually free us uh, from sin that we, we may walk in the likeness and the liberty that is found in Christ. Uh, there's a different gospel uh, that, is, uh, that is creeping into the church that Paul in, uh, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, he warns us about, the, this, uh, about this different gospel. And so things are serious both in and outside the church. Now in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it's a very, very important verse because Peter, he uh, gives us insight into how it is that we can interpret all the different things that are taking place uh, around us. Now, of course, the, the latest thing that has taken place has been the whole uh, issue of, uh, of the, the law that was signed in, uh, by the Supreme Court on June 26. But that is not the only issue that, uh, that we're facing. They're, they're, it's just like things are just mounting. You know, we had the issue of the redefinition of marriage. Then over the last two years, two to three years, uh, the racial climate uh, in America is getting more intense. Then we've got the, the looming threat of ISIS and, and, the, and, the, and the terror that comes with that. We've got the increase of, uh, of anti-Semitism in particular in the European nation. We've got all kinds of confusion with regards to the Middle East. Then we've got an, an election year coming up. And some of you guys are going, Stuart, please stop. This is getting worse. You know, it, we'll, we'll end on a good note here. Just so hang in there with me. But, uh, but, but things really are happening. And, and it's, it's just very intense times. Now, the Apostle Peter... In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, what is happening is that there was pressure that was mounting in the days of Rome, and, and, it, was, and it was coming against the church in a very intense way, uh, specifically that the, the Roman emperor at that particular time, uh, he wanted to start a new building project in, um, in Rome, and the Roman Senate, they denied his request. And so what he did was he figured, well, if they're going to deny my request, I'm just going to burn Rome down, which would enforce them to build the new buildings. And so he went and burnt Rome, and then he launched a campaign, and he blamed the Christians for the ones who burned out Rome. And that just really caused the pressure against the church to mount, and it was in the marketplace, it was in relationships and family, and all these different dynamics. And Peter says in the, in the first chapter, he says, look, he said, don't think as though something strange has come upon you. He goes, but recognize it as the refining fire of God to, to purify that which is more precious than a billion dollars, which is the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. And then, so he says, look, he says, this thing is about the purification of the church. He goes, secondly, in verse, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, he says, this is the, uh, the, the judgment of God in the household of God. And again, it's about the purification of the church. And so there's things that are happening that are, are painful, that are confusing, that are perplexing, that are troubling. But, and, and what I'm sharing this morning is not the entire counsel of God, but I think that from the Scripture that one of the things that we can ascertain is that it is actually designed to bring about a purification in the church so that we can grow up into all things that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the social, political, and moral pressures, they are causing... Uh, many to reevaluate their worldview. It's causing many people to rethink, what do I really believe? Or what do I believe about being an American? What do I believe about being a Christian? What do I believe politically? What do I believe morally? Uh, what do I believe about the Bible? What do I, is the Bible relevant today in the 21st century? Or was it only written for... Uh, the time in which it was written, but now it needs to be, you know, adjusted. It's almost like some people try to treat the Bible as though it's the, the Constitution. You can add amendments to it. But anyway, um, <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to say that, but anyway, it's, but <laughs> you, you come here long enough, you start getting comfortable, and then stuff starts slipping out. But anyway, uh, there is an, uh, so there's all of this stuff that is taking place, and Paul has yet another surprising thing to add to this because what is happening is it's causing, you know, you can go to Facebook and Twitter and, you know, Instagram and Periscope and all these different things, and, and it's causing uh, strife among people. I, I, you know, I go to Facebook sometimes and my stomach just hurts. I'm like, what are we doing? I mean, there's so much strife and throwing out ideas, and it's among believers in particular and uh, uh, that I notice this. And... Um, but here's what Paul has to say about this. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, 
He says, for there must be factions among you, or there must come divisions. It's a very strange thing. I mean, because Paul talks about us being a unity and getting rid of divisiveness, but here he says, no, actually, there's something that has happened, and in many ways that actually must happen. He said, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. He says this, he says this pressure, he says this line in the sand, the, the pressure, what it's doing, it is actually causing those who have said yes to the Lord at the deepest level to actually be strengthened and actually be manifest in their yes to Jesus. And yes, and those who have said no, it becomes very clear of those who have said no to the Lord as well. Now, it is not so that we can shun them and reject them, but so that we know clearly who to present the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to as well. But this is very painful uh, to, uh, to, uh, to watch all this happen. I know it's painful for me. There's, there's loss of relationships. There's a, a threat of losing some relationships. Then there's people that you've invested in. And then to watch them rethink uh, what they think and believe uh, about the gospel and what they think about the word of God and, and morality and so forth. And, uh, and it's essential that uh, today, in the time in which we live, that we begin to take stock, that we will begin to reevaluate and ask ourselves, listen, is the faith that we hold dear, is it the faith of the apostles, or is it the faith of the culture in which we live, or is it the faith of our political party, is it the faith of the left, or is it the faith of the right? And though the faith of the left is different than the faith of the right, and neither of them have a whole lot in common with the, with the faith of Christ. Uh, then there is the, the faith of our personal preferences uh, or the faith that is related to an area of sin that we have in our life that we can't get rid of. And because we can't get rid of it, we're beginning to rethink our understanding about what God is like in order to stay comfortable in that particular area. And so the Holy Spirit, I really believe, is inviting us to, to give ourselves to the Word of God, which I believe is our, our only hope. Our only hope really is to... Uh, to study and to meditate and to give ourselves to uh, God's Word. And even in the presentation earlier, uh, at the beginning of the service, it says the truth will set you free. Well, right before that, Jesus said that if you abide in my Word, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The, the discovery of truth happens in the context of you and I abiding uh, or remaining, or say differently, you and I living in the Word. And living in the Word it simply means that it is a regular part of our conversation with God. It is a regular part of something that in terms of our reading of it, and it's a regular part in terms of the way that we make decisions and the way that we live our lives according to the Word. That's what it means to abide in the Word. It means that we, we read it, uh, we meditate upon it, and we live according to that reality. And Jesus promises us, he says, look, if you do this, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then he says the most powerful thing later on. He says, he says, for the who the Son sets free is free indeed. And beloved, it's our only hope to begin giving ourselves back to the Word of God. I was talking to someone uh, just this week, and we're talking about the different issues that are manifesting in our society, within the church, and they were wrestling with the various issues. And I very kindly said to them, I said, look, I said, I'm concerned that you are taking a, an initial, your initial response to these issues is to figure out what you think about them and then go to the Word. I said, I want to urge you to change the way you do this. I, said, I want to urge you, go to the Scripture first and see what the Scripture has to say about these things and then align your thinking with what the Scripture says. It's the, the whole process of the renewing of our mind, and it comes according to the Word of God. Uh, this will allow us to stay faithful uh, to the assignment of being believers, of being gospel followers. And what do I mean by faithful? I mean faithful uh, in our marriages, faithful to our children, uh, in our family relationships, faithful to our friends, faithful to the Word, faithful to God's mission to make uh, the name of His Son great in the nations of the earth or through the sharing of the gospel is simply being faithful and being Christians according to the word of God. Now, in John 14, uh, verse 1, you know, Jesus said, he said, look, he said, see to it that you are not troubled. In John 16, 33, he says, I've told you these things that you may have peace. Which is, the, which is a positive way of saying, don't be troubled. Don't be weighed down uh, with anxiety. 
Now, uh, what is interesting is that on, uh, on June uh, 26, uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the law got signed, uh, I'm on the night watch, and uh, I go to bed about 4 o'clock in the morning and wake up around noon, and, and uh, 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 my wife, she, she walks uh, into, in, into the room and says, hey, you know, they signed the law, and a very bizarre thing happened to me. Instantly, this overwhelming sense of peace and joy just flooded my soul. I thought, honestly, it, it concerned me. I thought, my, why am I that disconnected? I mean, she just told me bad news, and I'm, filled, I'm happy about it, you know, so. But then, you know, but you know, don't get too excited because that lasted for about 24 hours, and uh, uh, because the, the very next day, just after having had so many conversations, having read so many tweets and newspaper articles and answering questions, I too began to drink the Kool-Aid and just got lost into all of the the anxiety that has come with the things that are taking place within our nation. Yet Jesus tells us, don't be troubled. And he says, in me, there is a place in me where we can find, uh, where we can find peace. It is so easy to, uh, to be troubled these days. You know, I, uh, came, I came here uh, yesterday, uh, t- took a train ride for, uh, from Kansas City. And, and, you know, on the train ride, I'm thinking, man, I've never heard of a train getting hijacked. Maybe today is the day. You know, you just start thinking, you know, you just go there, you know. And then, you know, and then I got off the train, and then I, you know, uh, you know, you know, well, praise God I made it. And then I'm on stage telling the story, and I'm, I'm thinking, don't give people ideas, you know what I mean? So you're just like, you know, and so just where your mind goes is just absolutely mind-boggling. And so, you know, so I feel pretty good, and then this afternoon I got to catch a train again. I'm going, oh, you know, so... It is so easy just to, you know, anyway, pray for me, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to get troubled, you know, or when the Ebola thing hit. I mean, it was all over the news. And, you know, I remember having, going on a ministry trip, going to North Carolina, and, uh, uh, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I put my stuff in the bin and have it go through the security scan, and I touched the first bin, and, and I thought, oh, no, what if this is affected with Ebola, you know? And then I thought, no, come on, sir, get with us. So I put the thing through. I had to grab another one. I'm like, well, it's just my luck for this to be the one that is affected with Ebola. You know, and then, um, and then my next thought was, well, I just read it probably takes about four to six hours for the symptoms to kick in. So for the next five to six hours, I'm like totally like this, going, uh, you know, when is this thing going to manifest? You know, so like I completely wasted my time in total anxiety. And here I am, you know, two years later with no Ebola. So you look back at it, you go, what was that all about? And, you know, and it's... <laughs> And so it is true what Jesus says, that worry and anxiety, it does not add anything to your life. I mean, it doesn't make you taller or shorter or live longer. It, it just robs your time. And, and, so, and so Jesus says, he says, look, he says, don't be troubled. He says, there is a way forward in this by actually living in a place of peace. Now, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, I just absolutely love this passage. It says that he will quiet us with his love. And that's what happens when you and I begin to access uh, 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 the presence of God that has been freely given to us through the cross. He begins to touch our hearts with the, the revelation of his love. If there's anything we need to be doing right now is to begin finding the passages that just uh, 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 that communicate to us how it is that God thinks and feels about us. And I tell you, John 13 to 17 is just loaded with passages and insight about how God feels about his people who are in Christ. And what it does, it has a a way of quieting our hearts. And right before that in Zephaniah 3, he also says that he rejoices over us with singing and he quiets us with his love. In other words, one of the ways that the Lord uh, uh, communicates to us, I really believe, is by putting a song in our hearts. Like, I, I want to encourage you to pay attention. Sometimes you find yourself awakened. You know, I, that happens to me from time to time. I wake up, and there's a song out of nowhere. This is a song that's on my heart. Or throughout the day, you just all of a sudden, there's a song that just drops in your heart. And we know what it's like. And at the end of the day, you go like, man, I've been singing this song all day. And, and there's just times when the Lord, I, really believe, I believe he does that. It says in, uh, 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 in Psalm 40 that he... Uh, I, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he, he inclined, and he, heard, he heard my cry, and it says, he pulled me out of the miry clay. He, he pulled me from the place of discouragement. He pulled me from the place of despair, 
And it says, he says, he put a new song in my heart. And what are the ways that God pulls us out of the despair by putting a song in our hearts? And, and when I begin to realize that this is the, one of the ways he communicates to us, I don't just let the song go by. I actually grab a hold of the song and I really make it my confession. And I found that when I do that, it actually begins to change the way that I feel about God, myself, those around us, the circumstances that I'm in. And so that's just a little practical point here that, that one of the ways that the Lord quiets our hearts with his love is by putting a song uh, in our hearts. And I encourage you to be engaged with that. Now, the, uh, the, the, the subject of an... Um, uh, of, of an um, of John 16, 33, of our hearts uh, being in a place of peace. So Jesus says, in this world you have many uh, tribulations. And this has tremendous impact for where we are at today. There are tribulations that are, uh, that are happening all across the earth. It's not even an issue of their coming. They're happening in the earth, and they're happening in different places more, uh, more than others. And, but and so this promise of us being a people of good cheer has tremendous significance to uh, the crisis that is in our land that is beginning to unfold. Um, Jesus said again in Matthew 24, 6, he says, see to it that you are not troubled. I mean, again, and again, he says, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. I would, say, I would dare say that is probably the biggest thing that affects me, that affects you, that affects the church, it is, it's a troubled heart. It's the troubled about the economy, troubled about our personal safety, per, troubled about uh, race relationships, troubled about 2016. It is all of these things. And the Lord, he, he speaks to us from the word. He said, he says, see to it. In other words, make sure, take care, be intentional about not being troubled. And the way that we uh, keep ourselves from being troubled is actually by simply giving ourselves to the place of prayer. Uh, turn with me to uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It's, a, it's an amazing passage. It's a very surprising passage, what is happening here in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. And what happens is, is Daniel, here he is um, in the prison, uh, not, not in the prison camp, but he is in exile. He, he was taken captive out of Israel. He is in Babylon. And um, and uh, he's a man of prayer, and his enemies they wanted to uh, uh, they wanted to do away with him. And so the way that they planned on doing that was they conspired against Daniel by convincing the king to sign a law into place that prohibited prayer to any god for thirty days except for prayer and 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 giving homage to the emperor. And so verse 10, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed. So he knew the law was written. Now undoubtedly, before the law was written, there was talk about this law beginning to emerge. Okay, very much kind of like what happened on, on June 26. It was months ago when there was talk about this law being before the Supreme Court. And so we knew this thing was coming. And on June 26, we knew that the writing was signed. And so in Daniel's day, here's this evil decree that's being made by the law, and look at Daniel's response. It seems really simple, but look what it says. I'm going to read it again. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. It's like, what? He went home. I just I find it interesting. I mean, here is a powerful political man who could have easily have gone uh, to the king's office or talk to the other leaders and said, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, if he was in the 21st century, he would have started a, a, a hashtag, you know, hashtag pray for 30 days or something. I don't know. He would have gone on social media. He could have gone on social media, blog, picked fights on Facebook. But instead what he did, he just went home. I just find that interesting. And when I read, you know, when I read uh, the, 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 the article, sometimes I just feel like yelling through the screen, go home, just go home, just stop saying stuff, just go home. <laughs> go to your families, go love up on your kids, just go home. And, but look what Daniel did, he goes home, the next sentence, and in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, he prayed, he gave thanks to God, 
as was his custom since his early days. It's amazing. By the way, it's not the only thing that Daniel did, but it was the initial response of Daniel. He goes, "Uh uh-oh. He goes, an evil decree was just signed. You know what? I'm just going to go home. (laughs) I'm just going to go home. And when I'm home, I'm going to do what I've always done. In fact, it says since his early days, one translation says since the days of his youth, it's believed that Daniel was likely about 75 years old when this happened in Daniel 6.10. And when referring to uh, since the days of his youth, uh, uh, many commentators or scholars believe that Daniel was about 13 to 15 years old when he started this journey of prayer. So here we see Daniel do something that he's done for 60 years. For 60 years he had given himself to regular prayer. Now I'm not saying that we should pray three times a day. That's not the point. The point is that he gave himself to prayer and it was his custom. And, And here's the point. What you and I do customarily is what we will do under pressure. What we do customarily outside of pressure is what we will do when under pressure. And Daniel, outside the pressure of this law, he was giving himself to prayer. It's what he did day in and day out, just as part of his devotion to the Lord, so that when the pressure came, he knew how to respond, and he got on his knees. And I love this. Not only did he pray, but he thanked God. Beloved, when as, as things are mounting, whether the redefining of marriage, uh, 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 terror threats, immigration laws, 2016, I mean, economy, beloved, we can get on our knees and we can thank God and say, Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your provision. Beloved, there is so much that we can be grateful for. And when we uh, walk in gratitude, it actually releases grace. One of the ways that we walk in good cheer is actually by having grateful hearts. It, it releases grace. It releases uh, an increase of sense of his life upon our hearts. It's where, there's so much that we can thank him for simply for who he is and who we are in the gospel and who he is to us and who we are to him and the things that he's done for us and the things that he's promised us. There's so much that we uh, are, are grateful for. That In the midst of the signing of this evil law, Daniel got on his knees and he thanked God. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, it says that anxiety in the heart, uh, excuse me, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. You know, there are many emotional ailments in our society and within the church. I don't want to be um, overly simplistic about it because I'm sure there are some emotional ailments that are related to different physiological conditions. But I do believe that many, if not most, of our emotional ailments are knit to the issue of anxiety. The scripture tells us that the source of depression, the, uh, the sense of despair, much of it is rooted in anxiety. And anxiety simply is this is when we seek to draw primarily from our own resources rather than the resources of God. It's when we, uh, uh, when we cling to our ability, but what causes us to be anxious is we see the limitations of our own ability and we look at the grandeur of the thing that's before us. And, and the way we overcome anxiety is by getting lost in God's ability, his ability to bring about change, his ability to provide, his ability uh, to see us through. And so... The way out of it is by giving ourselves to the good word. It says that the good word is what makes the heart glad. Again, as I mentioned earlier, as we begin to give ourselves to the scriptures, the scriptures about his love, the scriptures about his peace, even the scriptures about the trouble that will touch the nations of the the earth under his leadership, and yet in the midst of that, seeing that the church, that the kingdom of God will prevail, the gospel will will prevail. The church will grow strong. The church will be unified. The church won't always be confused about the matters of truth and grace. uh, Jesus is a perfect leader. He is the head of the body, and he's going to lead us into all truth by his spirit, and he's going to Uh, strengthen us in love. He's going to strengthen us in holiness. He's going to give us courage in the face of fear. And so even though things are uh, getting a little crazy out there, uh, we don't have to get swept away with it. Because remember, 
that the writer of Hebrews tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but you and I have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that's the reality in which we live, that you and I are, and by the way, to the measure that I am shaken by the shaking is only a reflection by how much my identity is within the culture rather than within the kingdom. When I find myself shaken, that is a tip off. Uh-oh, got to get realigned with God. That's, that's all it means. I don't, you know, I tell the young people back home all the time that a lot of times when we freak out is we're freaking out about freaking out. And so, and so when I freak out, I don't freak out about the freaking out. I take that as a message that goes, okay, time to get aligned with the Word of God. And, and then when we give ourselves to that good word, gladness actually begins to, uh, begins to touch our hearts in a, uh, in a wonderful way. Jesus continues. I want to read the verse again. He says, in this world, you will have tribulations. We will have tribulations. There's just no way out of it. You know, it's like one guy said in, uh, that, uh, he said, how many of you guys know that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega? And the church went, amen. You know, and another guy goes, uh, but how many of you know he's the A and the Z? And they go, amen. And he goes, now, how many of you know that between the B and the Y, it feels like you're going through hell sometimes? <laughs> and, uh, and that really is what, uh, what, what happens in this life. Tribulations is something that touches all of us. In fact, Paul says that through many trials and tribulations, you will inherit the kingdom. You know, I wish Jesus would have said, in this world, you might have tribulations. He says, you will have. It's like, oh, man. Will have, that sounds like a promise. Not the one you put on the refrigerator for Merry Christmas, but it's a promise, you know. It's not the one we claim, you know. But he says, no, he says, you will have tribulation. I'm like, man, are you sure? Look it up in the Greek. Yep, you will, you know what I mean? So it's, I mean, it is a stubborn verse. You will have tribulation. He goes, but cheer up. I'm like, well, that's easy for you to say. No, he says, but be of good cheer. In other words, be in a place where there's levity of heart, where you are convinced of the sense of well-being that is found in God. Joy to me is perspective. That's what joy is. Joy is something that we have when we have perspective, and that perspective actually comes uh, from the Scriptures. And then when you and I get perspective and experience joy, we become messengers of joy. We become messengers of the good news that, uh, that brings joy to people and that even in the midst of confusion and crisis, there is a grace that, that abounds that you and I can grab a hold of that will cause the buoyancy and the life and the joy and the peace of Christ to fill our spirit that we can actually be messengers of comfort and hope and peace and joy, not only to the church, but also to society that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beloved, the gospel will prevail. Let's have the worship team come up. The gospel will prevail during the, during the crisis, and way after the crisis, when Jesus Christ returns, the gospel will prevail. The church, the saints, will possess and receive the kingdom forever. We are called to be steady before the Lord. This perspective will, uh, uh, enables us to be steady uh, in the place of prayer, not only devotional prayer, but also intercessory prayer. And what do I mean by intercessory prayer? Yes, there are prayer meetings that we're going to go to, but I'm talking about the simple phrases that we, can, uh, uh, that we can whisper to the Lord even throughout the day. Yes, I believe in a set time for a devotional time. I believe that it's important to, you know, to go to a scheduled prayer meeting together with the saints and crowd to the Lord. But it's also an element where throughout the days we can whisper these very short, uh, powerful prayers uh, from our heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, we love you. Or Lord, send revival. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, strengthen my, my wife. Lord, strengthen my family. Lord, strengthen the church. These little phrases throughout the day, they really matter to the Lord. I want to end with this. There's several verses before in John 16 and verse 8, and Jesus says something very interesting. He says that, uh, uh, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world 
of righteousness, sin, and judgment to come. In other words, let's say it in a different way. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is having a conversation with the world. Instead of saying convict, you can say he's having a conversation with the world. The Holy Spirit is having a pointed conversation with the world. Whether the world realizes it or not, and whether we realize it or not, it's not the point. The point is that Jesus said the Spirit is having a conversation with human beings all across the nation of the earth. Now, as things are mounting, even on, you know, June 26th, the way I see many believers talk, it is as though the Holy Spirit left. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the Holy Spirit, he is all the more engaged right now, talking to people, when he's seeking to win people over. Only heaven knows how many people have turned to Christ in the last two weeks. I mean, that would be absolutely amazing to find out in the days to come how many people have turned to Christ because the Spirit is moving and he's having a conversation with people. Now, here's what we can do. He's inviting us, Jesus is to, he's inviting us to talk to him. And as we talk to him, it actually, I believe, it increases the, the operation of the Spirit uh, 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 in the nations of the earth. That as we talk to him about our families and our friends, I really believe that it, it releases an increased measure of the Holy Spirit upon our friends and upon our family. We pray for the church. He, the Holy Spirit is moving in and through the church. And as we uh, cry out in the place of prayer, uh, and, and again, you know, whether it's that 20-minute devotional time and, and that, you know, that one-hour uh, corporate prayer meeting, and whether it is those five to ten-second phrases that we whisper to the Lord throughout the day, know that our sound, the sound of our voice, it actually moves heaven. It really does. He loves uh, the, it says the scripture that he delights in the prayers of his people, that you and I actually move God with the sound of our voice. And as we pray, he will move in our friends and our family. He will move in the church. He will move in our government. I want to end it with this. Our nation is poised for a revival. It has to happen. No, it, it has to happen. It, it, there's, there is no way it is not going to happen. It has to. It is... Things are too dark out there. Somebody's going to turn the light on before this thing is over. It has to happen. It has happened before in the first great awakening on Jonathan Edwards. It's happened in Charles Finney's second great awakening. 500,000 people got saved, beloved, in eight weeks. In eight weeks, the second great awakening. I mean, it shook up the East Coast in a powerful way in the mid-1800s. Habakkuk says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. He said, I've heard of the things you've done in the past. He says, do it again in our day and in our time. Lord, you did it in the first century church. Lord, you did it in the 18th century. Lord, you did it in the 19th century. Lord, you did it. Do it again in the 21st century. Visit our nation with power. You did it in the days of the Welsh revival. Lord, you did it in Argentina. Lord, there are 2,000 years of stories of the gracious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, do it again, beloved. America is poor. It has to happen. It, there's no way that it can't happen. It has to happen. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will plumb line the church, that will just cause us to get lost in the wonder and the beauty of Jesus Christ and who he is and this glorious gospel and, uh, and giving us the grace to live accordingly to it. And even in the face of pressure, being able to stand tall and confident and communicate in the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations of the earth. I want to invite you to stand and let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. You said that uh, your son has overcome the world. Thank you, Jesus, that you've overcome. And that we can have confidence. We can have joy and we can have peace. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, for those who uh, have heavy hearts, those who are weighed down with anxiety, Father, send to them the good word that makes the heart glad. Father, put a song in their hearts. Father, say, reach a word would you cause your scriptures to come alive. Father, we pray for our families, our friends. Visit them with power. Father, for Christians, those who are in the balance with regards to truth, send forth light 
send forth truth and lead them into your presence. Father, we pray for the church in this nation, would you strengthen her with might? Father, we pray for our government. Lord, would you release the fear of the Lord? Father, we ask for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a revival, a third great awakening in America that brings honor and glory to your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.